you want access to bonus episodes, reading lists for every series of Empire, a chat community, discounts for all the books mentioned in the week's podcast, ad-free listening, and a weekly newsletter, sign up to Empire Club at www.empirepoduk.com. Feel like you got enough to do already? I do. That's why I use Ship Same Day Delivery to keep up with my busy life. They know the snacks I like down to the extra creamy in my peanut butter. I can get deliveries at home, on set, or even when I'm away on vacay. And my personal shopper, Amber, she's got my back. As in, she asks them to check the back if it's not on the shelf. Shipped. Delight in every delivery. Learn more at ship.com slash hi. I'm Jason Palmer, one of the hosts of The Intelligence, The Economist's daily current affairs podcast. The Economist's award-winning shows make sense of what matters, from our special series on China's president to our weekly podcasts on business, technology, and American politics, our journalists provide fair, in-depth reporting on the events shaping the world. Search for Economist Podcasts Plus and sign up to our free one-month trial. Through the Subaru Share the Love event, Subaru and retailers like us help charities like Make-A-Wish. That's how one Subaru retailer met Eva, a brave young girl battling a critical illness. We helped grant her wish of having a swimming pool, supplying pool toys and accessories to make her wish more meaningful. Thanks to the Subaru Share the Love event, over 3,300 wishes like Eva's have been granted. Learn more at Subaru.com share. Welcome to Empire with me, Anita Arnand. And me, William Drimple. I'm very excited this week because we've got somebody who I really hugely admire, respect, and I like. <laughs> yeah, she's my she's my mate in curry because I <laughs> come around for curry evenings around at mine. And, and Gabriel, well, not just being my friend, which is enough of an accolade, but author of Antarctica, an intimate portrait of the world's most mysterious continent. It is honestly an amazing book and which is why I really wanted her on one of our three ships because she turns Antarctica into a character herself. She's, I mean, she's so many things. She's a scientist, she's an adventurer, public speaker, has just come back from COP28 is when we're recording. Let's not talk about COP yet because that's still hanging in the balance. We're about to get a communique from them and we don't know what it's going to say yet. So, so not only is she all of those things, but she's here to talk about HMS endurance. And the reason that I really wanted Gabriel on this podcast is because in her writing and in her experiences and in the things that she's told me, she makes Antarctica just as much a character as Shackleton himself, who is an amazing, amazing man, a 20th century explorer who is famous here in, in Britain because, you know, he's in many ways one of, one of the pantheon of heroes and explorers in this country that we study when we're younger. But Gabriel, I mean, uh, uh, Willie hasn't heard you talk about Antarctica. You've spent a lot of time there. You've, had, you've lived there in, in one of those huts. <laughs> I became, honestly, I became a bit obsessed with Antarctica. I didn't even know it was a place that you could actually go to. And then I found out that it was. But I also found out it's the only place in the world that is really, it's, it's dedicated to peace and science. Those are the two things it's dedicated to. So you're not allowed to do any kind of military maneuvering there. You're not allowed to exploit it for any kind of business reasons. Basically, the only thing you're allowed to do if you're a government, you're allowed to have a scientific base there. And I was, I was writing about science. I was going to different parts of the world and looking at interesting science that was happening and how it's helping us to understand how the world worked. And then I realized that there's an entire continent where that was, they did nothing but that. And I thought I have to go there. But it wasn't just that. It's also, it's the only place in the world where there's no human history. Humans have never lived there because they couldn't. There's no life support. There's no, it's basically too hard. And so we know the name of the first person who was born on the continent. We didn't even meet the continent till the beginning of the, the 19th century. It's just, it's, it's the closest you can get to going to another planet. It's really, it's wild and wonderful. The first time I, I completely stole you from my husband, actually, I have to say, I confess, you were my husband's friend first. Same, same is true of us. I've, I met you through Simon, too. I also stole you from Simon, my husband. But the first time, and I just suddenly thought, you know, I'm having you, you're mine, um, was when you did a description. I wonder if you might indulge us a little bit about the experience of being in a whiteout in Antarctica. And yeah. you just come back from, you know, spending months out there. What is a whiteout, first of all? And, and tell us about walking into one. Well, so... 
when when people think about a whiteout, they think it's like a blizzard. You know, you have you have just lots of so much snow that you can't actually see anything. And you're kind of trapped in the middle of it. But that's one kind of whiteout, and they sort of tr- teach you how to deal with that if you're stuck in it. You have to this brilliant training session where everyone walks around with white buckets on their heads and tries to hold ropes and tangles up over <laughs> each other and, and trips up. So that's quite a fun kind of whiteout. But the other kind is one which is much much stranger, more numinous and more mysterious. And I've been really, I'd heard about these things. I'd really wanted to experience one. So the circumstances in which I did, I'd been to Antarctica quite a few times by this point, and I was actually trapped in the middle of Antarctica in a, in a station called Concordia. Every scientific base has its own thing. So like the, the American base, the main base has the only ATM, the only credit card machine on the island. The Italians have the best clothes. The French have the best food. The British base is very kind of um, very kind of uh, jolly hockey sticks and boy scouty. There's a Russian base that has the only kind of onion domed chapel on the, on the continent. But it all smells a little bit of kind of boiled cabbage. So they've all got their own thing. <laughs> so this, this, particular, this particular base called Concordia is, is unusual because it's actually jointly run by both the Italians and the French. So get this, so, so it had the fantastic clothes from the Italians, it had the fantastic food. The French chef there, actually, he was brilliant. Fabio he, from um, Accounts, Anita? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, on, yeah, tell us about the French chef, go on. Yeah. Well, the French chef, he, because, because Concordia, Antarctica is an extraordinary place, and in the centre of Antarctica, it's like a, a nice mountain. You're actually quite high up, you get altitude sickness, the danger of altitude sickness, because you're very high up, you're on top of this ice mountain in the centre, and it's really cold, like minus 40 degrees in the summer. And so it's quite a particular place to be. And it's actually, it turns out it's quite hard to make baguettes if you're that high up because the <laughs> air is thin, so the bread doesn't rise. So this right. particular French chef, he'd figured out a way to make baguettes even in this circumstance, but he would not tell anybody because he if he told anybody, they wouldn't keep asking him back year after year and he loved it there. So he guarded the secret, I think, to his grave about how you can make the perfect baguettes. Anyway, so there was a French chef, Italian chef competing with each other for the best food. The other thing I thought was funny about Concordia is I'd just been to the South Pole Station, which is the American station, also very high altitude, and they're very worried about you're getting altitude sickness there. So when you land, they tell you, you know, be very careful. Don't drink any caffeine or alcohol for the first few days. Make sure you stay hydrated and just be very aware of the possibility of altitude sickness. Well, Concordia is a similar height. I think it's actually slightly higher. And when we landed there on the little plane, first of all, the French were there waiting for us with a tray of champagne. (laughs) And then when we went inside... I went inside. There was an entire wall filled up with a massive espresso machine, which had been brought over from Italy. And the Italians were giving us coffee. So like, you know, have your alcohol, have your coffee. We were fine. You know, we were fine. But anyway, so I was there in this place and it was amazing. It, it was it, to, to be there only about 40 people in the summer that were constructing a new station. And I've been up till all hours of the morning drinking whiskey and playing cards with the French. And, and came out at two o'clock and you, know, you got used to, in the summer, it's just 24 hour day, like bright, bright, bright sunshine. And you get used to that any hour that you come out of the huts. So I came out about two o'clock in the morning and it wasn't like that. It was this weird kind of, I said, numinous, strange kind of light. And somebody said, it's a whiteout. Now, what this kind of whiteout is, is when the clouds are really low down. So you imagine that the ground is all ice as far as the eye can see. It's like a frozen sea of ice for for thousands of kilometers. So the clouds have come down really low, which means any sunlight gets scattered. And that means there are no shadows at all, like none. So if you walk on the snow and you crunch, your foot goes down in the snow, but you can't see a footprint. You can't see any, any definition, any shape, any direction. If you think about holding up a piece of paper, it's still got kind of a little bit of texture in it. But there's nothing around you has any texture. So I thought, I want to see this. I want to see it on my own. Now, in Antarctica, they're really straight. You can't go anywhere on your own. It's exhausting. So I legged it off. I sort of said goodnight to everyone, legged it off to the, the place where all the coats and, 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 and outer gear was, started quickly putting it on before anyone could notice. And the radio guy came out and he said, where are you going? And I said, I just really want to see it, please. And he said, go on then. Here's a radio, which I know is charged up. I will have this radio next to my bed, in, next to my head. If you have any problems, you call me straight away. We'll come out and get you. Don't tell anyone. So off I trotted and I left all the, all the, all the um, uh, huts and the tents and everything behind and went as far as I could so I couldn't see anything behind me. And then everywhere I looked, it was just, it was just white. It was like, it's like sensory deprivation, except that you've got a, a parka hood so you can see the edges of the hood. But everywhere you look, apart from that, you just see nothing. It's like nothing. 
And I had no idea. It's like, would that be scary? Would that be boring? Is it totally disorientating? It was so disorientating. Imagine you're crunching along and you look down, there's no footprints. There's no, there's nothing in any direction. Not even like you're in a cloud because a cloud always has texture. And so it was just like being in this kind of completely mystifying, mysterious heart of the most mysterious continent on earth with nobody and nothing around. Complete silence and this cold and then nothing and I was thinking, well, what would it, what would it feel like? Would it feel boring? Would it feel frightening? But I tell you what, it, it felt, it felt like being cradled. It was the most intimate way to experience magnificent, grand, fabulous nature. It just felt like being cradled. It was astonishing. Well, I mean, you are a very specific type of person because I can guarantee that both William and I, who seek sensory gratification <laughs> all over the place, would have gone. <laughs> completely postal <laughs> just within seconds you might have quite enjoyed sitting up with the playing cards with the French though to, to I was with you with the whiskey and the cards <laughs> and then it all went a bit wrong can, can we talk about the history of Antarctica so I mean you, you say you know we know the name of the first person born there and it just is a place that is hostile to humanity when did we know it even was a thing I mean was it was it uh, before we knew it was a thing did people guess it might be a thing no yeah, when was it spotted because even Australia was only you know Captain Cook in, in 1775 when did they get beyond that there was a sort of realisation there must be something out there because icebergs would every so often sort of come up and, and the kind of big tabular icebergs that you only get if you get ice flowing off land and not just kind of sea ice and there's, there's, there's very distinct kinds if the sea freezes and melts again it's not very thick and it's not very tall whereas icebergs could be could be like massive shelves and could almost be you know city size and so it was it was clear that there's something down there but there are all sorts of wacky theories even before anyone you know cook or anyone started going down there there was this kind of idea that there ought to be something to balance the art and it might be this place that had this big hole in the middle of it that took you to the center of the earth or weird caverns or aliens or strange creatures. But it was really, it was, it was the beginning of the 19th century when I think it, it was first circumnavigated the mainland and really first properly seen in like 1820. That was a, a Russian expedition. Mikhail Lazarev. That's right, and Bellingshausen, who had a, had a sea named after him as well. That's the one. Fabian Gottlieb von Bellinghausen. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great name. It's a terrific name, isn't it? There's many wonderful names in the history of exploration in Antarctica. But I think what, what, what kind of is interesting then is it, the, the, the next big phase of really trying to establish what Antarctica was was a lot more about whaling than it was about heroic exploration. And so certainly around the peninsula and parts of Antarctica, there was, a, there was a kind of big rush to sort of see, can we go get whales? Can we go get oil? It was the big oil rush of the 19th century. And the, the, the kind of heroic explorer stuff didn't really start until the end of the 19th century. So, I mean, it, ha it had raw materials that is the stuff, you know, the, the, the engine house of empire, really, you know, where there is fuel, where there is gold, where there is oil. And where there are, you know, whales who are, you know, so so comprehensively used for, you know, fuel, tallow, everything else as they were in the old days. This is a commodity. So were countries then trying to get their hands on it or was it just a question of just trying to find it and map it at the beginning? They were trying to get their hands on it, obviously. That's what we do, isn't it? And there's a, there's a part of the, uh, an island that's going to come into the story, South Georgia, which I visited a couple of years ago which became a kind of hotbed of the of, of whaling. In the Falklands War, wasn't it? Later, there was all that stuff, yeah. It was a feature in the Falklands War. That famous moment where Mrs Thatcher liberated the penguins. <laughs> yes. What was it? Jorge Luis Borges said it was two bald men fighting over a comb, which is my favourite description of the of the, the Falklands Mal Malvinas, whatever you want to call it. But anyway, so the Falklands, the Malvinas are, are, are quite close to the to, to uh, the South American continent. Then, really quite far out again, is this little ping prink of an island called um, South Georgia. And that became, because it was right there in the middle of the South Atlantic, that became the, the base for whaling. And the whales were absolutely everywhere. So if you go to visit the whaling station there, it's actually astonishing. It's heartbreaking. Ellen MacArthur sailed there to go and do some, just to sail across there. Ellen MacArthur, a famous sailor who then became an advocate of the circular economy. She sailed there with the intention of studying uh, albatrosses and, and hanging out with some scientists there. And when she saw the whaling station and realized the extent of the smash and grab that happened there, 
is amazing. Basically, there were whales everywhere. And so countries from the north went down there and got their whaling ships. And it was big. It was brutal. You see the size and scale of the of the devices they used to get the whales, dragging them on the shore, butchering them, getting the oils, this whole machinery. And then they just killed them all. And then when they were gone, the whole economy collapsed and they went home. So, I mean, you, you're, you're painting a picture of just seas of blood and, you know, the, the land stained with blood. So this is not Antarctica, though. This is the area around, because one of the things that I find fascinating about Antarctica is that you, you only have to go a few hundred meters inland, and the largest living creature is the size of a pinhead. So all of wow. the all of the yeah, <laughs> all of the um, resources really are in the sea. There's the, there's lots of nutrients in the sea. There's, there's whales. There's seals. There's there's fish all teeming around Antarctica. But when you actually go onto the continent, it's so cold, it's so dry, and there are no plants. There's nothing Mm. to make shelter. There's nothing to make fuel. There's nothing for food. Basically, the only food comes from the side. And historically, in human history, that's always been the case. There's never been a moment in, you know, the kind of first ice age when it was, uh, you know, the tropics. and In human history, absolutely. A hundred million years ago, a hundred million years ago, before long before humans were even a, a glint in the eye of whoever created this mess, <laughs> Antarctica was covered in ferns and forests and swamps and dinosaurs. So it's certainly in the past when the when the, the world's temperature has been a lot uh, warmer. Uh, it certainly has had had animals there, but in human history and long before that, there's been nothing. And in fact, this is it's, it's kind of interesting because in the um, the, the history of Antarctica, the ancient geological history of Antarctica, what actually happened was the continent was covered with trees and also had shallow seas all around it. And the shallow seas uh, had sea creatures living in them and the sea creatures got swamped by sand and started to get buried before they could rot and started to get buried more and more. And the trees fell into the shallow swamps and they got buried by mud before they could rot. And so the trees started turning into this thing that we now call coal and the sea creatures started turning into this thing that we now call oil and gas. So this was a mechanism whereby over 100 million years, carbon dioxide got pumped out of the air and into the ground. So Antarctica was hot and covered with dinosaurs and gradually it got colder as the world got colder and colder and colder and colder and covered in ice. And now in a few hundred years, we are starting to reverse that process and put that stuff back in the air and melt the continent. It's a hundred million years, a few hundred years. Wow. I mean, that, the scale of that is breathtaking. I want to talk about Shackleton now because, you know, <laughs> you're, you're painting. I mean, the, you know, the, the whole story of the whiteout, the whole story of the inhospitability of the place. And Shackleton is linked to it inextricably. Can, first of all, let's talk, let's talk about the man himself who was born in 1874 in County Kildare. He's an Irishman, charismatic. What do we know about him? What do you know about his personality? Irish or Anglo-Irish? Anglo-Irish. Anglo-Irish. Name like that. <laughs> so he was Anglo-Irish. Yeah. So he he was a fascinating guy. I mean, basically, when he was back at home, he was often, I think people could often sort of see him as a bit of a joke. He was was always hustling and and slightly behind the game. He he, he ended up being a merchant seaman. He wasn't in the Navy. He wasn't really respected. He was half Irish. And, you know, the Irish were were considered to be considerably below the English then, you know, compared to the, you know, proper upright Captain Scott. He was, he was a kind of also ran. But he also, he had get rich quick schemes he hustled he 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 wasn't really you know a towering figure or anything but the second he got anywhere in trouble especially the second he got onto the continent of antarctica he became the most magnificent leader you know yeah. there's one thing i think there's, there's a sort of saying that if you want a quick dash to the pole and be the first one at the south pole then give me amundsen the guy who actually made it to the south pole first and did it very efficiently norwegian and if you want a scientific expedition where you do lots of other things give me give me scott who did actually do quite a bit of science along the way to his doomed attempt to survive going to the south pole but if you're in a hell of a hole get down on your knees and pray for Shackleton every time. A magnificent leader. That's such a great mm-hmm. quote. I love it. Isn't it? Isn't oh, it that's such a great quote. No, but the, the other thing, I mean, before we sort of dismiss him as, you know, sort of the um, I, 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 Dell boy of the sort of, you know, exploring <laughs> community. <laughs> I mean, he did, He did. to be fair, he went to Dulwich College, which, you know, is, was known at the time as a private school, and I'm quoting here, a private school that raised true sons of the British Empire. Yes, this yeah. is very much his reputation. Yeah, 
And I think in a way, if, if you think about it, at the time, the kind of heroic age of Antarctic exploration started towards the end of the 19th century. And then there have been, been a few expeditions down there. And, and one of the first ones, it wasn't the first one, but one of the first ones was Captain Scott and Ernest Shackleton went down to Antarctica to try to get to the South Pole. Is this 1901? Is that a 1901, this is 1901. expedition? Yeah. Before we get there, I have to ask as to why was Scott's second name Falcon? I wish I was called <laughs> William Falcon de Rimple. Well, it's a wonderful <laughs> Was his dad a bird watcher, a twitcher, or what? <laughs> I, I have to say, I do not know. And I feel like I want to rush to find out. It's all right. Somebody's going to know. They'll, they'll tweet us. Anita it's all right. Gabriel Falcon Walker. <laughs> Gabriel Falcon Walker. I, I see your point. Absolutely fair. I need to chaff in John. Let's face facts. I'm no Falcon. <laughs> well, would you be more of a Robin? No, I think you've got a heart of a Falcon, Anita. I definitely can oh, see a heart and soul God, of a Falcon. I love this. This is why she's not my husband's friend anymore. She's mine. I'm mine. Uh, okay, so we were talking about the 1901 expedition. So back to the story. Uh, what I was yeah. trying to do is, so, so Shackleton did go to Dulwich College. He was a son of the empire, but he was always a kind of also ran in, in, the, in the way that he perceived himself and the way that many others perceived him. Because compared to Scott, when they went on this expedition, Scott blamed him. It was a, it was a failure and Scott blamed Shackleton. And what happened was they, they didn't really manage to, they managed to make a hut. They found an island to sort of start off from. Nobody had really explored Antarctica very much. And then they, they got a little bit of the way, uh, things kept going wrong. And eventually Shackleton got scurvy and they didn't know what it was, but he got scurvy. And, and they ended up, they, they had to come back with their tails between their legs, having made almost no progress. But Shackleton had to be carried back on a, on a sled because he wasn't fit to, to ski. And so that became a beginning of a real kind of rivalry between him and Scott, because Scott had to blame it on somebody. It couldn't be his bad leadership. And so it was all kind of Shackleton's fault. And Shackleton was humiliated at having to be brought back in that way and having that blame. How old is Shackleton at this point and how old would Scott have been? They'd have been somewhere in their 20s. Very young. Yeah, okay. so it's two so young so, chaps. Yeah. Very young man. Yeah. Yeah. But also, I mean, is it is it true to say that, you know, Scott, who was this sort of upright and some may say uptight kind of gentleman, was a little bit threatened by Shackleton's bonhomie and brogue, you know, the fact that he was incredibly likable. Absolutely, totally. And, uh, you know, he, he, Scott never had that charisma and and um, Shackleton had it effortlessly. So that would definitely have been part of it too. Okay, so, I mean, that was a failure. And also the two men have got bad blood after this. Were they, I mean, were they enemies by now or were they definitely rivals as rather than Well, friends? define enemies, define enemies. I'm sure that they spoke about each other very pleasantly in, 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 in company and behind closed doors, I'm sure that they didn't. And, you know, it, it definitely it became a rivalry that became more pronounced when Shackleton went back without Scott on his own to have another go at the South Pole. And Scott was furious. Without telling Scott? Well, well, not without inviting Scott and making, making it all about Shackleton. So Scott was furious. As far as he was concerned, he'd led the first expedition. So the South Pole belonged to him and only to him. And so that Shackleton went there and actually tried to mount an expedition without him was something that was really... This is the Nimrod expedition of 1907. Right. So he's, you know, it's, ta it's taken him a, a few years to, to get himself together. Was that a successful expedition? I would say defined success. Because the, the point is, the <laughs> point is the <laughs> Stop making me define things. I refuse to define anything now. Go on. Well, I, I will define it for you then, because <laughs> okay. many people say no because he didn't make it to the South Pole. So he he had he turned back within a hundred miles of the South Pole. Did he know he was only a hundred miles from the South Pole? Yes, he knew exactly where yeah. he was. Uh, so so nineteen oh one that expedition they knew how far they got. And it was almost nowhere. It was very very short. But rather pathetic attempt to get anywhere. Shackleton went right across the Great Barrier, which is the Great Floating Ice Sheet, up the Shackleton Glacier, still named after him, along the, the Great Plateau, discovered the Great Plateau, got within 100 miles of the South Pole with great success, realised that he was not going to be able to get to, he could get to the Pole with his men, but then they would not have enough food to get home. And he made what I consider to be one of the bravest decisions that's ever been made in Antarctica, which is a decision to turn back. He never lost a man, did he, on any of it? He never lost a man. He didn't ever lose someone. He said, "Better a live donkey than a dead lion." Mm. But he was—he was no donkey. The, the courage to know that you were in, in, in sight of that and to turn back, and and also he—he he made the biggest leap in exploration between the edge of the sea and and within a hundred miles of the South Pole that anyone ever did. So you could say he didn't make it to the South Pole, but I would count that as a rousing success. 
There's a rather wonderful quote from one of his team just describing just how difficult this this whole thing was. It was sort of Christmas 1908 and he's incredibly depressed because the whole thing's not gone to plan. And um, he says, uh, may none but my worst enemies ever spend their Christmas in such a dreary, God-forsaken spot as this. Here we are nine and a half thousand feet above sea level, further away from civilization than any human being has ever been, with a gale blowing, a drift snow flying, and a temperature of 52 degrees of frost. I mean, it's not, it's not, it's not the best Christmas. I mean, any one of you who's moaning about the Christmas you've just had, this is a properly hard Christmas. This is worse. So, so, so he turns back. Is he then greeted as a, again, you know, a serial loser when he comes back? Well, I, I think, I, I think serial loser is putting it a bit harshly. I, you know, I think, no, he isn't because he still managed to get up more expeditions. He's still a heroic explorer. But, you know, uh, Scott, Scott would certainly have not wanted to lose any opportunity to point out that he, he didn't make it. I, I was just reflecting on that quote. I was thinking, you know, I'm dreaming of a white Christmas. It's not exactly a white Christmas like that, is it? But, no. um, <laughs> but, but, but also one of the things about Shackleton, one of the many things about his incredible leadership is that for him, a, a kind of optimistic attitude is not just a kind of a pleasant thing to have around, but is utterly essential for ex- every expedition and for any hope of success. And so he was never, ever one to say, this is miserable, this has gone wrong. In, in a way, he valued his men on the basis of whether they were willing to just just to keep on their spirits up. Gabriel, I'm quite interested in, in what they're eating at this point. There's, there's something about pemmican. Tell me about <laughs> pemmican and have you ever had it? <laughs> I have had pemmican. It's really, it, it's, it's a funny thing as well. Lots of the um, lots of the Antarctic explorers. So pemmican is this, it's rather revolting. It's kind of a meat with as much fat as you can possibly cram into it, kind of dried and and, and put into packets, and then you turn it into a kind of um, soupy stew with with melted snow. Uh, the, the thing that's kind of funny about it is that it's supposed to be giving you as many calories as possible when you're pulling sledges and walking in freezing cold. But they used to have food dreams. And, and their food dreams were about having un- <laughs> well, their, their food their food dreams they were, their food dreams were about having un- unlimited pemmican and and the, the, they also had this thing called hoozing do you know about this where no so that, that? so that um, the food was being fairly distributed first of all someone would ladle it into each of the different cups and then someone else would turn around so they couldn't see the cups and they point to one and say who's and who's ah. and who's so they point to them all and that's the way it was completely fair distribution that's nobody could say that's not brilliant. fair they got it, isn't it isn't it isn't it well that's that's why people were loyal to him he wasn't unfair he didn't sort of oh that's amazing yeah. and then the the other thing about pemmican is that I, I i found this when i was in antarctica the many times that i went it's still a thing is it i mean you can still go to the french no, station no. when you get away from the baguettes <laughs> no, and, no she just had baguettes <laughs> she had baguettes and whiskey <laughs> and the, the french, the french <laughs> base on the coast which is a bigger base actually had both a chef and a pastry chef so you could actually have, get meal fee on the French face of the coast. Not maybe a pemmican nonsense. They just are a more civilized people, aren't they? they at are. the end of the day, they, they are. really are. They oh. very much are. They very much are. But but in the different bases, one of the things that you know, especially if you're out in a camp, you, you don't get fresh vegetables. You, if you want to have a, anyone in a camp love you, take fresh bread and take alcohol, or take fresh vegetables. If any have just come in on a ship, they will love you for it. But you start to you start to love the food that's there. You eat things that you'd never eat anywhere else, like instant mashed potatoes potato yum and then you come back and you go what was that all about that, so i think it's kind of like that with the with, with, with the pemmican they had these food dreams of pemmican and they come when i get home i'll have pemmican by my bed that i can eat it anytime i want to you go home and go what, what, what was i thinking so that's your pemmican for you so look i mean it's you know as you say it's not been an abject failure but it hasn't been what he wanted it to be but now there is the race 1911 we're talking about now the race to the south pole is now full throttle. Tell us about that and about the major players in that and what's Shackleton doing while Mm -hmm. they're doing this? So the race to the South Pole is now, Scott is going back. Shackleton hasn't made it to the South Pole, so Scott is mounting this great expedition. Uh, Shackleton is emphatically not invited to said expedition, <laughs> by the way. And so off goes Scott for this great expedition. But meanwhile, there's, there's terrifying news that this guy, uh, Roald Amundsen, who is a Norwegian explorer, is supposed to be going to, to go up to the North Pole to the Arctic. And then suddenly they get word that he's actually turning south and it's going to be a race. Scott is <gasps> disgusted. He's horrified. It's not exactly gentlemanly. It's not cricket. You know, I've claimed the South Pole for mine. Someone else shouldn't be doing this. And so so that, that's what began this race. So they they both went via New Zealand and then off they sailed. Uh, 
Scott was thinking about going into this place called the Bay of Wales, which had a, a route up onto the, the great floating ice shelf, which is like a cliff of ice when you sail up to it, but there's actually kind of bay and a, a way up there. So Scott was thinking about going there, but when they went along there, they found that Amundsen's ship was already bedded in the Bay of Wales. And so off they sailed to the island that Scott and Shackleton had used before and said they were going to start off from there. Uh, how far was Amundsen ahead of them? How, how many? No, they weren't. Or... Nobody was ahead of anybody because you can't, you have to wait for the summer so you so you, you sail down there you get in there towards the end of the first summer you have to uh, spend the winter there and then the next uh, spring you can start off and, and they're each going to start off and uh, Amundsen's gone down with his dogs and his experience skiing he's a Norwegian he's been probably born on skis Scott's gone with a, a weird combination of tractors and ponies and dogs and all sorts of stuff and there's been acres written about whether they're the right thing the wrong thing but basically there they are poised and ready they're having their winters and they're ready to start on the South Pole come the next spring. Right. Let's take a break there because it's so exciting. And I told you she was good. Didn't <laughs> I tell you she was good? Tell me. Yeah, no, I, tell you I, I, I didn't uh, doubt it. Yeah, yeah. Join you didn't us tell after me she had the pemicab, break. Pemicab, though. No, I didn't. Well, she ne- you never. Actually, to be fair, you never told me about the pemicab. Seriously, I know you definitely have to bring some round next time. I, I insist. I have to keep you fresh, Anita. Otherwise, you won't keep talking to me. There's always got to be okay. something more. Okay. That's <laughs> mystery in our relationship. Uh, join us after the break when we find out what happens in the summer. Sergeant and Mr. Smith, you're gonna love this house. Bunk beds in a closet? There's no field manual for finding the right home. But when you do, USAA Homeowners Insurance can help protect it the right way. Restrictions apply. Deck your home with Blinds.com. DIY or let us install. Free design consultation. Free samples and free shipping. Free, 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 free. Hurry to Blinds.com's biggest year end blowout and save 40% site wide. Rules and restrictions may apply. Feel like you got enough to do already? I do. That's why I use Ship Same Day Delivery to keep up with my busy life. They know the snacks I like down to the extra creamy in my peanut butter. I can get deliveries at home, on set, or even when I'm away on vacay. And my personal shopper, Amber, she's got my back. As in, she asks them to check the back if it's not on the shelf. Shipped. Delight in every delivery. Learn more at ship.com slash hi. Welcome back. So just before the break, we were on this, I mean, it really is a cliff edge of a story of the race to the South Pole with Amundsen and Scott both vying for the crown. Is I'm very unimpressed by the fact that Scott brought a tractor. <laughs> Yes, I know, but Cable's okay, got a cat. Did you not see the cat just leap on the keyboard? It's a massive Ferguson. <laughs> my, be- my beautiful black cat, she always wants to be involved in everything. She's a terrific storyteller. Okay, all right. Well, cat. Hello, cat. So, look, what happens? Who gets over the line first and, and how does this end? It ends badly, as you can probably guess. And so lots of things happen along the way. But basically, Amundsen does a terrific job. He gets his team together. They ski to the South Pole with their dogs. They're very unromantic and unsentimental about it. They get there. They plant their tent and their flag. They leave a little note in there saying, uh, probably the next person to be here is going to be Captain Scott. Welcome, Captain Scott. Can you take this back? No, no, no. No, 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 no. 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 <laughs> Cheeky buggers. <laughs> yeah. How do you, I, I, sorry, it's probably a very basic question to a scientist, but how do you know you've got to the South Pole? Does your compass do something bonkers and go round and round a circle or? Yeah, yeah. So you can actually, uh, it's relatively simple to measure. What, what, to make sure that you've actually made it there, you actually have to sort of go a, a kind of kilometre or so either way and just you know, kind of make sure you stomp all over the ground so that you, your instruments haven't gone slightly awry. But the South Pole and the North Pole, the only two points of the world where the sun actually rotates around the the horizon in the summer that they're the points where uh, the sun doesn't dip or rise it just goes round in a circle exactly round and really? so you, you know exactly yes yeah, so you know exactly where you are even with uh, with with non um, uh, digital modern day satellite instruments that's what Amundsen did he got there Scott, meanwhile, was having all sorts of troubles. Tractors I'm not didn't surprised really work. If you a tractor. The, 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 the <laughs> tractor didn't really work. The ponies kind of struggled a bit. They got to the bottom of the Shackleton Glacier. They went up the glacier. They started pulling. They began to run out of food. 
just things things weren't going right. And then eventually, as they were up on this plateau, and and you know, Anita's brilliant quote of how um, uh, miserable the winter was there. They you know they had wind of the face and they had the freezing temperatures. And then they started to see the tracks, and they knew that they, they'd been beaten. So they followed the tracks to the tent. They found the tent, and Scott said, "Great God, this is an awful place." And terrible enough to get here without the, the benefit of priority. So they were uh, they were thoroughly miserable. And then, you know, they, they had the pictures How many are outside they the at tent. This the, at this point, there's five of them, I believe. There was supposed to be four, and at the last minute, they added an extra one, which wasn't really very helpful for the food either. The other other support groups would kind of take them along the way and then listen. And they'd left some, they'd left some uh, food depots on the way to get back. And I must have been there a whole month earlier, 33 days. Yep, yep. So that was embarrassing too, but it got worse because as they were coming back, it, it things went from bad to worse. They got sort of one, one, one got sick. Another, famously, um, Captain Oates, he had probably scurvy, and, and he was he was slowing them down, and he realised that, and eventually he famously said, "I'm going out now. I may be some time." And they all knew he was going to walk to his death, but they pretended in this kind of very British gentlemanly fashion. It wasn't that. It's such a British line, that isn't it? Exactly, yeah. isn't it? And eventually they got socked in with a blizzard within only only a mile or so, a really short distance from the food depot they were trying to reach, and they never managed to reach it, so they died. A mile. Oh. It was a very short distance. It might have, might have been more than a mile, but it was very walkable within 10 miles. God, it's heartbreaking, isn't it? Heartbreaking. Yeah, exactly. It's just heartbreaking. Yeah. And then, and then Scott, actually, they were still writing their diaries, trying to keep their spirits up. They knew no one was going to come for them. In the end, Scott wrote, for God's sake, look after our people. And that's the last thing he wrote in his diary. Yeah, that, that last diary date. Can I just, just share it? It's just, it's, I mean, it's such a poignant story. 29th of March, 1912, the very last exhausted, hungry, tired and mm. jaded entry in that diary. Hmm. Scott's body is probably now uh, in the form of spaghetti, but I thought you might like to Why? know that. But... What? Why? <laughs> because what they actually well, yes. did was they just buried the men where they, when they found them the next, uh, next spring. They buried them in their own tent. And uh, what happens in Antarctica is the ice flows everywhere all the time. It's constantly flowing. And as it's flowing, it's stretching. And their bodies, our bodies are all made basically of water, which, which takes the form of the ice. And so as they were being squeezed and stretched towards the coast, they'd have been stretched out to like eight feet, nine feet, 10 feet of these kind the of human bodies. The human bodies will be, will be stretched like that within, within the ice. Yeah. And, 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 and what's going to happen to them in the end is that the ice will make its way to the edge where it will break off and become an iceberg and they'll float off into the Southern Ocean. The ice will melt and the bodies will just fall gently to the bottom of the sea. Wow. That's an amazing story. That's extraordinary. So now, look, so this is this is obviously, you know, a, a national mourning that this has happened. They've lost Scott. They loved Scott. You know, they, everyone loved Scott. But then you think that would put people off going for some time. But no. I mean, it's only two years later that Shackleton decides he's going to try. Yes, And this does. is where endurance comes in. It's always the ships with the good names that do it, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. If it isn't endeavour, it's endurance. Yeah, we, we, <laughs> we wanted to come to the ship. I mean, this is part of Three Ships. Gabriel, I don't know whether you know, but this is uh, Three Ships for Christmas after the Christmas ah, Carol. Yeah, yes, uh, of see course. See what we did? See what we did? Yes, you know, came up with that. <laughs> tell us about, um, first of all, tell us why does Shackleton think two years after this very sad episode and, and the demise of, of Scott – that he's going to try again? And how does he come to meet endurance? So, well, if you think about it, okay, now the South Pole has been conquered. There's been a tragedy in the sort of the British ranks that the Norwegians have won. But this is, this is a, uh, this has now become a kind of imperial endeavor. It's like the Norwegians have claimed the South Pole. What can I claim? And, and how can my being a heroic adventurer actually claim something for the British crown in a more meaningful way? And, and remember, there's also his kind of Anglo Irish, uh, merchant seaman, not Navy, uh, wasn't invited on the on the Scott expedition, his, but but really feels like he is a leader. He is someone who can do this, and so he decides that since the South Pole has already been conquered, why not go one bigger? Why not do an expedition where you actually walk across the entire continent, not to the South Pole and back, but start on one sea and walk across the entire continent to get to the other? And very fittingly, considering the topic of this particular podcast, he called it the Imperial. Transantarctic expedition. As far as I know, that was the first time the word imperial has come into one of these expedition titles, the Imperial Transantarctic Expedition. And what's the 
backing for this? Is he is he looking for sponsorship or is this a British government thing or what's the He's always looking for sponsorship and you, you always need to you always need some some rich people who are gonna sponsor it that want one way or another and uh and this is this is not you know Scott went as captain of the British Navy so this is a British government whereas Shackleton always had to cobble together the funding always had to cobble together the sponsors. Scott was a kind of leading light of the Royal Geographical Society. Shackleton was 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 going around the place hustling trying to get the money in. And so you know it was really it was a hustle but he hustled well and he got this lovely little ship called the endurance that was perfectly placed the expedition was going to have two elements one ship was going to go to the ross sea which is where all those expeditions had started before and crossed from that side and, and lay food depots and the other one was going to start on the other side and walk across the whole way so the one on the Rossi was there to lead, lay depots and the one on the other side was going to walk across the whole thing but a little matter of timing this is 1914 yes the war has started or? No, no, the war has no. very much not started. When right. he sets off, the war has not started and nobody has any idea that there's going to be one. And just imagine this, they, when they set off, we'll, we'll come to the end of the story. I don't, want to, I don't want to do a spoiler alert. We never do that. We never do that on this program. <laughs> so we're known for it. Anyone who might survive, anyone who might survive from the disaster to come will get back to the, to the world and find that the world's gone mad. God, that's weird, isn't it? So all of this time, they, yeah. they have no idea. They leave in the Edwardian era and they come back in the middle of World War I. Wow. Okay, so, so why, why the endurance? Is there something special about the endurance? And, and it's a wooden boat, which, which is yeah. seemingly not like? brilliantly strong in, if you're dealing no, with No, no, so, so the things. idea, in a way, it was, it was perfectly sensible as a ship to, to go there. What's important also is, is the shape. They have these kind of slightly rounded shapes so the ice can't get hold of them and they have kind of double hulls and things like that. So it was a perfectly sensible ship to take down there. How many people can go on it? Is it comfortable? I mean, what's it like to travel on this? So uh, uh, first of all, it's men only. Secondly, it has lots of dogs on it and the dogs are, are, are breeding dogs so they can have puppies so they can pull their sledge. So they've got their sledges, they've got provisions. And they learnt from Amundsen. Yes. Yes, they did. The Norwegians have shown how you can do this. There's no ponies, there's no tractors, this is this is yeah. dogs. They've got, you know, the, the, the men sleep in hammocks, there's a captain's cabin, there's the there's the expedition leader's cabin, there's a there's there's lots of provisions on board. It's it's, it's well over provisioned. It's not, not just provision for the ship, but it's provision for the expedition that's about to, to come. And and they've got all these crates, I've seen some of them, crates with big imperial transantarctic expeditions stamped all over them. So there's no question about it, this is going to be an an imperial thing. Not, not a massive ship, but uh, but perfectly sensible for sailing into these waters. But the place that it had to go, the, the ship that went to the Ross Sea side, they kind of knew what they were they were getting into. That's the food depot ship. The food yeah. depot ship that's going to be yeah, okay. But uh -huh. the endurance was having to go to the other side, which is where all the whaling had taken place, and having to sail into the Weddell Sea. Now the Weddell Sea is famous for its ice; it gets really choked up with ice, and the icebergs come sailing out of there. So they knew that there was going to be a potential issue with ice icebergs and sea ice in the Weddell Sea, and they were ready for it. So off they sailed. They're going to start on this side. They're going to start walking over. The other guys are going to set the depots and then Dob's going to be a good one. They can march across the continent and claim it for his imperial majesty back at home. But it doesn't happen. But <laughs> it didn't but. quite work like that. <laughs> Guess what happened? Guess, guess what, what happened? happened. Yeah, yeah. You'll never this guess. Is gonna, You'll this never is going to be our cliff edge for the next one. What happens, Gabriel? What happened is the ship got gripped in the in the pinions of the ice and the ice took hold of it, held it and started to squeeze. We're going to leave it there. Join us in the next episode of Empire to find out what happens to all those very brave men on board. That will be out on Thursday or if you are a friend of the ship or a gold tier member of the Empire Podcast Club, you can hear that next episode right now. All you need to do is go to empirepoduk.com and you can sign up there. So if you do sign up, see you in a second. But if you don't, well, it have to wait until Thursday. Till then, it's goodbye from me, Anita Arnon. Bye from me, William Dorimple.